Hey folks, I'm Hunor, and in this course we are going to build a racing game with 3GS. In the game, the player controls the car on the left track and has to race as many laps as possible without colliding with any other vehicles. As the game goes on, more and more vehicles pop up on the right track and avoiding them becomes trickier. The only thing you can do to avoid a collision is to accelerate or decelerate the car. You can't fully stop it though. So while it's easy at the beginning, it will get quite tough as more and more vehicles show up on the other track. In this course, we are going through how to build this game with 3GS. We start with the basics. We set up the scene, the lights and the camera. Then we build a minimalistic car by putting together boxes. We also add texture to it to paint the windows. For our textures, we are not just going to import an image. We are going to code our textures with HTML canvas. Once finishing with the car, we create a racetrack. We talk about how to draw two-dimensional shapes in 3GS and how to turn them into extruded geometries. This part will also contain some trigonometry, as we need to calculate some angles to draw the track. Don't worry though, we are going to cover everything in detail. And once we know how to create a car, and the track in the 3D space, we will add the game logic. We add event handlers and the main animation loop that will move around the vehicles and take care of the game logic. There's a lot to cover in this course, so let's get right into it. The only thing you need as a prerequisite is a basic understanding of JavaScript. We won't do anything crazy with JavaScript, but we won't go through the code line by line either. So let's start with setting up our project. To generate graphics, we use 3.js. 3.js is a JavaScript library that uses WebGL under the hood to generate 3D graphics in the browsers. Now you might be thinking, ok, but why don't we just use WebGL then? WebGL is a rather low-level API and you need to do a lot, even to paint a simple box on the screen. On the other hand, 3.js is like playing with Lego. We just put together a scene with some geometries, add some light, set up the camera, and we have a 3D render. As 3GS is a library, we need to add it to our project first. There are several ways to do this. Probably the easiest is if you're using CodePen.io. I use CodePen for most of my demos because you always have a live preview while you're coding and you can easily share your work with others. If you use CodePen, after you create a pen, you have to go to Settings and under the JS tab, you need to add 3JS as an external library. If you prefer to code on your local computer though, then you also need to make sure to import 3JS. You can use npm to install 3JS to your project, then import it. Once we add the 3JS to our project, let's start by setting up the scene. We are going to set up lights, the camera, and the renderer. I add the 3.js to my project with Node Package Manager, so as a first step I import it here. Then first, let's create a 3.js scene. A scene is a container. It will contain all the 3D objects that we want to display and the lights. Here we generate a 3D object representing the player's car with a function that we are going to discuss in a minute. Then we add this car to the scene. As a next step, let's add the lights. We have two lights, an ambient light and a directional light. The ambient light is shining from every direction. We use it to have a base color for our objects. We define an ambient light by setting its color and intensity. The color is usually white. The intensity is a number between 0 and 1. The two lights we define will be used simultaneously, so we want each of the intensities to be around 0 0.5. Once we define the light, we add it to the scene and we define a directional light. We set up a directional light in a similar way as the ambient light, by setting a color and an intensity. The directional light will also have a position. And the position here is a bit misleading, 
because it doesn't mean that the light is shining from that position. The directional light is like the sun. It shines from very far away with parallel light rays. With the position, we define the direction of these light rays. From all the parallel rays, we define one. This specific light ray will shine from the position we define to the 0, 0, 0 coordinate. The rest will be in parallel. By setting the position of the light, we determine which side of our objects will be the brightest and which ones stay in the dark. Here the light we define is primarily shining from the top, so the top of the car will be the brightest. The light is also significantly moved along the y-axis, so the right side of the car will also receive a good amount of light, but less. And while the light is also moved a bit along the x-axis, the front of the car won't receive that much light. If you go back to the code, here we define the light's position by setting its x, y, and z coordinate. We can see that the x value is indeed the lowest, so that's why the front of the car is the darkest. The y and z values are close. Still, the z position is the highest value, hence the top of the car is the brightest. Now that we have lights, let's set up the camera and define how do we look at the scene. There are two options here. There are perspective cameras and orthographic ones. Video games mostly use perspective cameras because how they work is closer to how we see things in real life. In this game though, we are going to use orthographic projection. With orthographic projections, things will have the same size no matter how far away they are from the camera. They also don't distort the geometries. The parallel lines will remain in parallel. This will give our game a more minimal, geometric look. For both types of cameras, we have to define a view for them. This is the region in the 3D space that is going to be projected to the screen. We are not going to use a perspective camera in this game, but if you want to experiment with it, this is how you can set it up. In this figure, you can also see how this projection works. Everything within the view system is projected towards the viewpoint with a straight line. You only need to define four parameters to define a perspective camera. You need to define a field of view, which is the vertical angle from the viewpoint. Then you define an aspect ratio of the width and height of the frame. Then the last two parameters define how far the near and far planes are from the viewpoint. Things that are too close to the camera will be ignored, and things that are too far away will be ignored as well. Of course, normally, the near plane is closer to the camera because you don't want to miss things right in front of you. This is just an example. Then there's orthographic camera that we are actually going to use. Here we are not projecting things towards a single point, but towards a surface. Each projection line is in parallel. That's why it doesn't matter how far objects are from the camera, and that's why it doesn't distort the geometries. For an orthographic camera, we have to define how far each plane is from the viewpoint. We define that the left plane is 75 units away to the left, the right plane is 75 units away to the right, and so on. Here these units don't represent screen pixels. There's going to be a later setting where we display the rendered scene in the browser. Here these values have an arbitrary unit that we will use in the 3D space. Later on, when defining 3D objects in the space, we are going to use the same unit to set their size and position. Regardless of what camera are we using, we also need to position it and turn it in a direction. Because Here we are moving the camera by 200 units along the X and Y axis and move it along the Z axis by 300 units. Then we set which direction is upwards. We set that the Z axis should point upwards. This is not the default. By default the Y axis points upwards. And finally, we set that the camera should be looking towards the 000 coordinate. 
This way, through this camera, we can see three sides of our car. The final piece we need to set up is a renderer that renders a scene in our browser. We define a WebGL renderer. This is the piece that renders our scene into an image according to our camera, then displays it in our HTML. Here we also set up the actual size of the canvas. We want to fill the whole browser window, so we pass on the window's size. And finally, the last line here has this rendered image to our HTML document. It will use an HTML canvas element to display the image. As a next step, let's see how can we compose a car. In the first round, we will create a car without textures. It's going to be a minimalistic design. We just put together four boxes. We define the car function we used before to return our 3D object. This function starts with creating a 3GS group and ends with returning it. This group is another container like the scene. It can hold 3GS objects. It is convenient because when we will move the car, we will simply move around the group and we don't need to move each individual piece of the car. First we create the back wheels. We will define a gray box that will represent both back wheels. As we never see the car from below, the player will never notice that instead of having two back wheels, we only have one big box. We define the back wheels as a mesh. A mesh is a combination of a geometry and a material and it represents the 3D object. The geometry defines the shape of our object. In this case, we create a box by setting its dimensions along the x, y, and z axis to be 12, 33, and 12 units. Then we set a material that will define the appearance of our mesh. There are different material options. The main difference between them is how they react to light. We use Mesh Lambert material. The Mesh Lambert material calculates the color for each vertex. In case of drawing a box, that's basically each side. We add this box to the scene by adding it to the group and adding the whole group to the scene. By default, the box will be in the middle. Its center will be at the 0, 0, 0 coordinate. Let's move it into position. First we raise it by half of its height, so instead of sinking in halfway to the ground, it will lay on the ground. Then we move it back along the x-axis to reach its final position. In the same way, we can define the front wheels as well. It's exactly the same geometry and material. The only difference is that we move this one in the other direction along the x-axis. Then we define the main part of the car. The geometry will be another box with different dimensions. This mesh will raise above the ground by setting its Z position higher than half of its height. Then the same way we add the top of the cabin as another mesh. Before moving on with the textures, let's adjust a few things. You can see that the back wheels and the front wheels are ultimately the same mesh. Instead of defining them twice, we can create another function that creates this mesh. This will also come in handy if we define other vehicle types. If we define a truck, for instance, we can use the same wheels there as well. We could optimize this even more. We recreate the same box geometries and materials for each wheel. We could create one global wheel geometry and wheel material and reuse them each time we create a new wheel. Here we keep it simple though, for a minimal game like this, it doesn't make that much of a difference. As a next step, we can also randomize the color of the cars. On the top, we have an array of possible color codes for the vehicles as hex values. On the bottom, we define a utility function that picks a random value of a given array. Let's use these when setting the color of the main part. We call this utility function to pick a color from our colors array, and that will be our car's color. This way, when creating a new car, it can end up being red, yellow, or green, 
or any other color you list in this array. Now that we have a very basic car model, let's add some texture to the cabin. We are going to paint the windows. We will define a texture for the sides and one for the front and back of the cabin. When we set up the appearance of the mesh with the material, setting a color is not the only option. We can also map a texture. We can provide the same texture for every side, or we can provide materials for each side in an array. We are going to do the second option to have different textures on the different sides. As you can see, some textures won't fit right away. 3GS doesn't know how we want them, so we will need to adjust them by rotating or mirroring them till they reach their final position. To have a texture, we could use an image. But instead of that, we are going to do the extra mile and create textures with JavaScript. We are going to code images with HTML canvas and JavaScript. Before we continue, we need to make some distinctions between 3JS and HTML canvas, because otherwise things might get a bit confusing. 3JS is a JavaScript library. It uses WebGL under the hood to render 3D objects into an image and it displays the final result in a canvas element. HTML canvas, on the other hand, is an HTML element, just like the div element or the paragraph tag. What makes it special, though, is that we can draw shapes on this element with JavaScript. This is how 3GS renders the scene in the browser. And this is how we are going to create our textures. So let's see how we can do that. As we are going to draw on canvas, first we need to create a canvas element. While here we create an HTML element, this element will never be part of our HTML structure. On its own, it won't be displayed on the page. Instead, we will turn it into 3GS texture. Let's see how can we draw on this canvas. First, we define the width and height of this canvas. This size has nothing to do with how big the canvas will appear. It's more like the resolution of the texture. Once we define the size, we get the 2D drawing context. We can use this context to execute drawing commands. First, we are going to fill the walk canvas with a white rectangle. To do so, first we set the fill style to be white. Then fill a rectangle by setting its top left position and its size. When drawing on a canvas, by default, the 0, 0 coordinate will be at the top left corner. Then we fill another rectangle with a gray color. This one starts at the 8, 8 coordinate, and it doesn't fill the canvas, it only paints the window. And that's it. We draw two rectangles with JavaScript to an HTML canvas. Then the last line turns the canvas element into a texture and returns it so we can use it for our car. In a similar way, we can define the side texture. We create a canvas element again, we get its context, and then first fill the whole canvas to have a base color, then draw the windows as rectangles. Of course, these two windows have different starting positions and different sizes, yet the idea is the same. Now let's see how can we map these textures to our car. When we define the mesh, for the top of the cabin, instead of setting only one material, we set one for each side. We define an array of six materials. We map textures to the sides of the cabin, while the top and bottom will still just have a plain color. If you map these textures just like that, then some of them, like the front texture, won't look like how we want it to be. To fix the front texture, we have to set the rotation and turn it by 90 degrees. We have to set this rotation in radians, so we set it to half pi. Before turning it though, we have to make sure that the texture is rotated around its center. This is not the default. We have to set that the center of the rotation is halfway both vertically and horizontally. We set 0.5 on both axes, which is basically 50%. Now these two are good. If you turn around the car though, we will see that the two other textures are a bit off as well. Let's start with the back texture. We do the same thing as we did before, 
except we turn this one the other way. Then finally, we need to flip the left side to fix it. We flip it along the y-axis to have it in the correct position. And that's how we set up our textures. We draw on canvas elements with JavaScript, turn them into textures, and map them. The same way as we created the car, we can create a truck or a tree. We are not going to get to the details here because it's ultimately the same thing. The truck is also a group of boxes. It can even use the same wheel function that we created for the car. The only difference here is that the cabin's material receives both the color and the texture, and 3JS will mix the two together. For the trees, we use both the sphere and the box geometry. To have a bit of diversity, we can even generate trees with different sizes. I let you figure these out as an exercise. And instead, let's move on with something more interesting, the racetrack. Let's see how to set up our racetrack. Our racetrack will have two layers. The bottom layer is a plane geometry. This is just a flat surface and it will be ultimately the track itself. We will add some texture to it for the line markings. Then we have three islands and the surrounding field. We will define these as two-dimensional shapes, then we turn them into an extruded geometry. An extruded geometry basically turns 2D shapes into 3D objects by giving them a depth. They will not just float above the ground, but they will stick out of it. Now let's see how do we build up these shapes. If we look at the track from above, we will see that under the hood we only have a few circles. And to draw these islands, we need to draw some arcs. Let's walk through how can we draw an arc and what parameters do we need to draw one. Let's take this one. First, we need to define its center position. This will be somewhere on the x-axis. Then we need to set a radius for this circle and we have to say from which angle does the arc start and where does it end. The arcs are symmetric to the x-axis so the start and end angles have the same value with opposite signs. To define this arc, we can just make up an angle. Let's say it starts at 60 degrees and it ends at minus 60 degrees. But then when we draw this other arc, we need to know where exactly should it start and end to match the previous one. We need them to look connected so that they form a shape together. The second arc has a different center position, a different radius, and a different angle as well. We need to calculate these values for a precise match. In a similar way, we need to calculate the angle for the small island in between, and the angle for the outer arcs. So before drawing our track, let's calculate these values. To calculate the values we need, we are going to use trigonometry. So let's have a quick review on how the sine and cosine functions work. Trigonometry says that in a right triangle, the sine value of an angle equals to the opposite side's length divided by the hypotenuse. In a similar way, the cosine value of an angle equals the adjacent side divided by the hypotenuse. In other words, we can say that if we multiply the sine value of an angle with the hypotenuse, then we get the opposite side's length. Or the cosine value of an angle multiplied by the hypotenuse equals to the adjacent side. In our example, the hypotenuse will always be the radius of a circle, and we are going to use trigonometry to get the position of a point on the circle. Trigonometric functions also have reverse functions. We can calculate an angle in a right triangle if we know the opposite side and the hypotenuse, or the adjacent side and the hypotenuse. We are going to use these functions as well. Now let's see how can we make use of these functions to get the angles and positions we need to draw our track. First we define a track radius. This will be the distance from the center of the track to the line markings. Then we define a track width. From these two, we can calculate the inner track radius and the outer track radius. If we want to compare the sizes defined here with the car we defined earlier, then this is how the car will look like on the track. 
Now let's calculate the angles we need for drawing the islands. We define the first angle to be 60 degrees. We have to define the angles in radians though, so we set it to 1 third pi. Then we calculate the value that we need temporarily to get the second angle. This value gives us how far away the starting point of this arc is from the x-axis. This distance is the opposite side of a right triangle, so we can multiply the psi value of our angle with the inner track radius to get this size. Now that we know this value, we can calculate the second angle. This angle should point to the same position. Here we also have a right triangle, and one of the sides is the same as the one we just calculated. We can use trigonometry again to get this angle. Now we do the reverse calculation, so we use arc sine. And the radius is also different now, so we use the outer track radius in the calculation. Now we know these two angles. It's time to calculate the center position of these arcs. So far we didn't actually know how to place them or what's the distance between the two. We use trigonometry again to get the distance of the two centers. First we get the horizontal distance from the center of the left arc to the point where the arc starts. We want to get the adjacent side of a right triangle, so now we use the cosine function. And then we do the same thing with the other side. The other side of course has a different angle and a different radius. If we add these two values together, we get the distance of the two centers. And if we divide this value by 2, then we get the distance of each circle from the center of our coordinate system. I call this value arc center x. One arc center will be at the minus arc center x 0 position, and the other will be at the plus arc center x 0. Knowing the center position of these arcs and the first two angles, we can draw the left and right islands. To draw the middle island and the other field, we still need to calculate two other angles. To get the angle for the middle island, we use the inner track radius and arc center x, which is calculated. With these values, we can use arc cosine to get the angle. In a similar way, we can use the outer track radius and arc center x to get the angle we use for the outer field. Now we have all the angles and positions we need. We can start drawing our track. Before we draw the field, first let's make sure that the camera is at the right angle and the whole field will fit inside the scene. At the beginning, where we defined the camera, we had a camera width setting. We set this value to fit the car inside the picture and now we have to fit the wall track. So we change this value from 150 units to 960. The second thing we want to change is that so far we were looking at the car from the side and now as we are creating this track, we want to see it from above. We change the camera position. And let's also remove the setting that tells which way is up. As we are looking downwards now, this setting would only confuse the camera. And finally, let's call the function that we are just about to define, the function that draws the map. This function receives two parameters, the width and height defining the size of the map. The width will be the same as the camera width, as horizontally the track will fill the wall image. And of course we want to fill the wall image vertically as well, but to achieve this the height has to be bigger than the camera height. If we would only look at the track from above, then the same height would be fine. But later we are going to move the camera along the y-axis to see the track a bit from the side. And then, with the rotating camera, the value needs to be higher because otherwise we would see the edges of the map. Now let's see how do we define the render map function. The render map function adds two things to the scene. A gray plane with the line markings and a few islands with the green fields that stand out of it. First we create the plane. This will be a two-dimensional surface that will be our foundation. It's another mesh consisting of a geometry and a material. The plane geometry takes the width and height that the render map function received as a parameter. At first we can define the material with a plain gray color. 
Once we created the mesh, we added it directly to the scene. Then instead of defining the material with a plain color, we can also set up a texture for it. Let's see how this texture is created. We create a texture the same way we did before for the car. Except for this time, we are not just filling rectangles. We are going to draw arcs. We create a canvas element again, draw to its context, and in the last line, we return the canvas element as a texture. It's important that we set the size of the canvas to be the same as the width and height of the plane. This is because we want to be able to use the same units we use in 3JS when drawing on the canvas. First we start as before and we fill the whole canvas with a plain color. Then we set up a few things for the first circle. We are going to draw the circle as a stroke. We set the stroke to be 2 units wide and we set the color for it. Then we also set a dash array. This array defines that after 10 unit stroke, there will be a 14 units gap. Once we set these things up, we can draw our circles. Unfortunately, in HTML canvas, there's no command to draw a circle. Instead, we have to draw an arc. We already talked about how to define an arc. We have to set its center position, its radius, and its starting and ending angle. Here, because we are drawing a full circle, we start at 0 degrees and finish at 360 degrees, or in radians, we go from 0 to 2 pi's. First we set the position using the arc center x value we calculated earlier. You might note that we don't simply set the center to be at the minus arc center x 0 position, we also add half of the map size. This is because, even though in 3JS the center of the coordinate system is in the middle, in HTML canvas it always starts in the top left corner of the canvas. So first we calculate the center of the canvas, then go from there. You might also note that the arc command is not a standalone command. The arc has to be part of a path, even if it's the only one. Whenever we draw a path in HTML canvas, we always start with the begin path then we have one or more comments, then we finish with the stroke or fill command. Here we don't want to fill this shape, we just got the border of it, so we finish with the stroke command. In the same way we draw the other circle. The only difference here is the position. Here you might be wondering why don't we just use one path instead of two. If we would define one path with two arcs, then HTML canvas would try to connect them to have a continuous stroke. We don't want that. We want to have two separate circles, so we define two separate paths. Now back in the render map function, we see that we use our new texture and we see the result on the right. Let's move on with drawing our islands. We are going to draw our islands as two-dimensional shapes then we turn them into an extruded geometry. The extruded geometry is just another geometry, like the box or the plane geometry we just used. As a parameter though, it takes one or more two-dimensional shapes and an options object. In this options object, what we primarily want to set is the depth of the geometry. In our case, how much should these islands stand out from the ground? The second option is setting if you want to use a bevel. The default is true, and that would make our edges rounded. We don't want that, so we set this value to false. And once we create this geometry, we define a mesh with it, that we can add to the scene. This mesh will have two materials, one for the top and one for the sides. We want to have a different color on the top of these islands and on their side. Now let's see how do we create this two-dimensional island that we turn into an extruded geometry. Let's check out the getLeftIsland function. The getLeftIsland function will return a 3GS shape. And this is where things will get confusing again, as a 3GS shape works in a very similar way as an HTML canvas. We have similar commands with similar parameters. Here we draw an arc again, and we draw an arc by providing the same parameters. We set the center position, the radius, the angles, and if the arc should go clockwise or not. 
but there are differences as well. First of all, the function name is apps arc, which means that the arc is absolutely positioned. Earlier in HTML Canvas, we also used absolute positioning, just the function name is different. Then the positioning is also different. Earlier we positioned the shapes relative to the top left corner of the canvas. With 3GS shapes, we don't have a top left corner. We place things in the infinite space and the 0, 0 coordinate is right in the middle of the screen. So we can just say that the center of the arc is at the minus arc center x 0 position. Then we set the radius and the angles. The starting angle is arc angle 1 and the ending angle is the opposite. We also state that this arc goes counterclockwise. You might also note that unlike in HTML canvas, this arc doesn't start with the begin path command and it doesn't end with stroke or fill command either. This is because the wall 3 js shape is a path itself and the two arcs we define here together will define the shape. So let's see the other arc. The other arc has a different center position, a different radius, this one is using the outer track radius, and it has another angle. It doesn't just use the angle we calculated earlier. The angles always start from the right side, and this arc is in the opposite direction. So first we do a half turn, and then turn by arc angle 2. It's also important to note that this arc is going clockwise. The two arcs we define here need to define a continuous path, because otherwise they wouldn't end up in a shape. The same way we define the getLeftIsland function, we can define a two-dimensional shape for the island in the middle. First we draw the arc from the left, then we continue it with the arc from the right. Both of these arcs use the inner track radius, both use arc angle 3, which we calculated specifically for this island, and they both go clockwise. Then we can create a two-dimensional shape for the right island as well. This is literally the same shape as the left one, except it's mirrored, so some of the values have the opposite sign. Then we draw the two-dimensional shape of the outer field. This function receives the size of the map because we want to fill the whole map. We start this one from the outside. With the first command, we move to the bottom left corner of the map. If you are using subtitles, they might overlap. And as the map's height is twice as the camera height, it should be actually outside of the visible area. I'm cheating a bit here. Then from the bottom left corner, we draw a straight line to the middle of the bottom edge. Drawing commands always continue the previous command, both here where we define a 3GS shape and in HTML canvas. The line2 command always draws a straight line from the point where the last drawing command has ended. Then we draw the last outer arc. This is similar to the arcs we drew before. It uses the outer track radius, arc angle 4, and it goes clockwise. And while it's not connected with the previous path segment directly, it is implied that it continues the previous command. We still have a continuous path. Then we draw the other arc. It also goes clockwise in order to continue the path. Then we go down to the bottom edge with a straight line, and then we go around the edges of the map. We go to the right first, then up, then to the left. And then again we don't need to close the shape. It is implied that the shape will close itself, because otherwise it would be just a path and not a shape. Now back in the render map function, now all our islands and the outer field are passed on to the extruded geometry. They are all part of the field mesh. And that's how we create the track. Now if we move the camera position along the y-axis to have a look at the scene from an angle, then we see that the extruded geometry stands out from the ground. Feel free to decorate the track with some other objects, add trees or buildings around the track. You can create a nice map even with some basic boxes and other geometries. Now that we know how to create a car and we drew our racetrack, it's time to finally add the game logic. 
Here's an overview of the main parts of the game that we are about to cover. As we saw, we have a player car variable that is global and it represents the 3GS mesh of the player's car. This is the car that the player can control by accelerating or decelerating it. We are also going to have an array of the other vehicles. These are cars or trucks that move on the other track. To populate this array, we are going to have an add vehicle function that generates a random car or truck with its own color, speed and direction. Then we are going to have the main animation loop. This keeps everything moving and handles the game logic like adding new vehicles and calling hit detection. This will keep track of some global variables like player angle moved and score. We also have event handling that accelerates and decelerates the player. And finally, we have a reset function that sets everything back to initial and a start function that will kick up the animation. So let's go over all of these in detail. We start with reset. Even though it might sound like this is the last thing we need to call, we also use it to initialize things. This code snippet here is after we initialize the scene, we added the player's car and the track, and we initialize the camera and the renderer. We start with defining some globals. We define a ready variable. This is a boolean, and its value is true if we can start the game. This variable will help us not to trigger the animation loop more than once. We define the player angle moved, which we will see in a second, and the score variable along with the reference to the score element. The later points to an HTML element in our HTML structure. We don't cover the HTML structure here, because it mainly just consists of the canvas element that 3GS generates. To turn this into a real game, you might want to add the result screen and the instructions via HTML, and the score indicator. If you want this line to work, you need to have an HTML tag somewhere in your HTML with the ID score. Then we also have the other vehicles array and the last timestamp that we use in animation. Then we call our reset function to initialize these values. The reset function serves both as a reset and for initialization. The only interesting part here is that when we reset the other vehicles array, we don't just set it to an empty array, we also have to remove the vehicles from the scene. We also reset the player position by calling a function we are going to discuss later. This will move the player's car to the starting position. And as a last step, we render the current state of the scene. Remember this piece of code is after the lines where we added the player's car and the track to the scene and we initialized the renderer. And in the last line we state that we are ready to start the game. Then we add event handlers. We want to listen to the key down and key up events, specifically when the player hits the up or down keys. These event listeners will primarily change two other globals the accelerate and decelerate variables. Once the up arrow is held down, the accelerate variable should be true. And once the down arrow is held down, the decelerate variable should be true. We also have a third case here. Pressing the R key, we reset the game by calling the reset function we just defined. Pressing down the up arrow will also start the game by calling the start game function. This will check if the game is in a ready state, and if it is, then starts the animation loop. The primary purpose of this ready variable is to avoid triggering the animation loop more than once. Every time the player presses the up key, the start game function will be called, but only the first time will it trigger the animation loop. The animation loop is triggered by the renderer's set animation loop function. This works in a very similar way as the request animation frameworks. We pass in a callback that takes care of the animation logic. The main difference is that the request animation frame function only runs once, and after every animation frame, we have to trigger the next one. With set animation loop, this is automatic, and you have to specifically tell the animation to stop. So let's see how we create the animation loop. The animation function will move everything that needs to move and take care of the game logic. 
It will add new vehicles to the track when needed, update the score, and even call hit detection. It receives a timestamp. This timestamp is constantly increasing as the game goes. We could better use the time difference between the two animation frames, so we calculate that. We keep track of the previous animation frame's timestamp in a variable called last timestamp. And in every turn, we subtract this value from the current timestamp to get the time passed between the two animation cycles. We call the time passed between two animation frames time delta. At the end of every animation frame, we render the modified scene. Let's see what happens before that. First, we move the player's car. We call the move player car function and pass on the time passed. Let's see how it works. The player's car should move around the track in a circle. Instead of defining the car's position by an x and y coordinate, we define it with an angle. This angle will tell where should the car be around the circle, and from this we will calculate the x and y position. This angle has two components, the starting position and the actual movement the car made. We separate these two because when we calculate how many laps the player took, we will only use the actual movement and not the initial position. The player starts at 180 degrees, which is pi in radians. This initial position we call player angle initial. This is a constant value. And as the game goes, we increase, or as the car goes clockwise actually we decrease, the player angle moved variable. These two angles make up the total player angle, which we will use to calculate the car's position. But first, let's see how the player angle move variable is changing. In every animation loop, we calculate by how much should this angle change. First we calculate the player speed, which will give us the desired rotation per milliseconds. Then we multiply it by the time passed to get by how much should the car move in this animation frame. This is a delta value that we subtract from the current angle. To get the player speed, we define another utility function. This function will give us a speed depending on the accelerate and decelerate globals. If the player is accelerating, it gives back double the base speed, and if it's decelerating, it only gives back half of it. And if no acceleration or deceleration is happening, then it gives back the base speed. This base speed we define as a constant. It has to be a very small number. It represents how much the angle changes every millisecond if no acceleration or deceleration is happening. Now let's calculate from this angle how do we get the x and y position of the car. We use trigonometry again. We can draw a right triangle between the center of the track and the car. Then we can calculate the horizontal component of this triangle using the cosine function. Then to get the x position of the car, we shift this by the circle's position. In a similar way, we calculate the vertical component of this triangle with the sine function. We can calculate the x and y position this way for any given angle. On every animation frame, we change the angle, then recalculate the actual position with trigonometry. The last thing we need to calculate here is the car's angle. The car is also rotating as it goes around the track. This rotation should always be the main angle minus 90 degrees. Now that we place the player's car, let's go back to the animation function and see what else do we have. Once the player moved, we can recalculate if it made another lap. We recalculate the number of laps by dividing the moved angle with a full turn that is 360 degrees. As we use radians, we divide it by 2 pi. We also use map.floor here because we also want to have a wall number. We don't want something like 1.5 laps. Then we also check if the number of laps equals the score number, and if not, then change it. We have this condition here because we don't want to update the HTML element representing the score with every animation frame. If it didn't change, then we don't update the DOM. The main animation loop 
also takes care of adding other vehicles. When the game starts and with every 5 laps, we add a new vehicle to the other track. We check how many other vehicles we already have, and if we need more, then we add one. Let's see how the add vehicles function works. The add vehicle function will add a new car or truck both to the scene and to the other vehicles array. It picks a random vehicle type, a car or a truck, then creates a mesh for it. In this course we didn't cover how to do a truck, because you can do it in a very similar way as the car. I let you figure out how to create a track yourself, or if you want you can add even more vehicle types to this game. We add this mesh to the scene first, then we set up a few other parameters for this vehicle. First we need to decide if the vehicle will go clockwise or counterclockwise. We do this by generating a random number between 0 and 1 and check if it's more than half. Then we decide on the starting position. If it goes clockwise, then the vehicle starts at the top of the track at 90 degrees at half pi in radians. If it goes counterclockwise, then it starts at the bottom of the track at minus half pi. We do this because we want to give the player some time before it potentially crashes into this new car that just popped up out of nowhere. Then we need to figure out the speed multiplier. This is a multiplier because we are going to multiply the base speed with this value. So if the speed multiplier of a vehicle is 1, then that vehicle will go with the same speed as the player by default. The speed multiplier will be a random number in a range, depending on the vehicle type. In case of a car, it will be somewhere between 1 and 2. As a last step, we add all these to 3D mesh the direction, position and speed to the other vehicles array for later access. We are about to need all these when moving around the vehicles. Let's see how that goes. Back in the animation function, the next thing we are about to do is to animate these other vehicles. This function also receives the time delta variable because the movement depends on the time passed. In this function, we do a very similar thing as we did before when moving around the player's car. We go through the other vehicles array, and based on their direction and speed, we change their angle. Then we use this new angle to calculate the x and y position of the vehicle, along with their rotation, and place them accordingly. Now back in the animation function, there is a last thing we need to do. Hit detection. Once both the player and every other vehicle's position has been updated, we need to make sure that the player didn't crash into any other vehicles. The other cars don't crash, they can go through each other. The player though has to avoid collision. Let's see this scenario. The player is entering the intersection, while another vehicle is over there. How do we know if they crashed? We are going to calculate hit zones. Each vehicle has two of them, and if they overlap, then we have a crash. This is not necessarily the most precise calculation. It can happen that the cars do not hit each other yet, but the hit detection already indicates a crash because of the hit zones overlap. The hit detection we are about to cover here is a rather basic one. You can always create a more precise one or even use another third-party library to calculate collision. We are about to see that we don't need to calculate circles here. We only need to figure out the center of these zones, then we can see if they are too close to each other or not. So let's calculate the center position of these hit zones with a new utility function. We pass onto this function a few things. We pass on the player car's position. Then we also pass on the player's angle and the fact that it goes clockwise. The last thing we pass on is how far away should the center of the hit zone be comparing to the car's position. From all these values, our utility function will give us the x and y coordinate of the center of the hit zone. It uses trigonometry again to get the horizontal and vertical distance from the player's position. Now the same way we can get the center of the other hit zone. We pass on the same parameters, 
except this one is shifted backwards. Then we go through all the other vehicles. We go through the other vehicles array with the sum function. This function will give back true in case any of the vehicles have a hit. We can define different hit zones and hit detection for different vehicle types. A truck, for instance, might be longer, so we can even define three hit zones. We only cover the cars here now. We define hit zones the same way as we define for the player's car. We pass on the other vehicle's position, direction, and so on. Then once we get the position of these hit zones, we calculate the distance between the player's hit zones and the other vehicle's hit zones. We use another utility function that gives back the distance between two points. It uses the Pythagorean theorem. That says the distance between two points is the square root of the sum of the vertical and horizontal distances square. We have a hit if the frontal hit zone of the player's car is too close to any of the other vehicle's hit zones, or when the front of the other vehicle is too close to the back of the player's car. We don't cover the hit detection with the truck, because we didn't cover how to draw the truck either. You can define it in a similar way. If for any of the vehicles one of the hit zones is too close, our hit variable will be true. In this case, we can stop the game. We can stop the animation loop by passing on null to the set animation loop function. This will stop everything. And because the game is not in the ready state, the player won't restart the animation loop accidentally by pressing the up key. This is also the right place to add some other logic, like showing up a result screen with the final score and telling how to restart the game. Which we can already do, by the way. If you remember, in the event handlers we define the case for resetting the game. If you hit the R key, it will call the reset function, which resets all the variables we changed and removes every other vehicle from the scene. It also resets the ready indicator, so next time the player hits the up key, it will start another game. If we did everything right, then we finally have a game. It was a long course, and I know some parts were rather complicated. So if you want to go through the code in more detail, then you can find the whole source code on CodePen. The link is below in the description. If you want to play around with the code, you can find the fork button at the bottom right corner that will make a copy for you. This version you can change as you like, and your changes will be saved to your account. Thank you for watching. If you like this course, please subscribe. I have some other 3GS game ideas I'm planning to cover and I'm also uploading web development related courses on other topics. Let me know what you would like to learn next and if you have any feedback for this course. And don't forget to check out my earlier videos on game development. See you at the next one.